Okay. If you remember, I'm sure you do because you're all bright. We were looking at the design of prismatic beams, where we were specifically now choosing a particular beam for its characteristics, not just the usual stuff we've done in the past where we might say, well, maybe maybe the A and B of a rectangular cross-section should be such and such, but actually picking a commercially available beam of some kind. So we'll review that with a problem here, and then we're going to take a step beyond it. So uh, we've got a 16-foot beam here with a slight overhang, and some kind of uniform load. Thirteen hundred pounds per foot. So perhaps a snow load or something, nice uniform load like that. And you're given two things that the allowable normal stress is 24 KSI. So uh, by that, uh, I guess it implies that the material has already been chosen. The beam itself has not. So you're going to have to specify a particular beam that will satisfy these two Constraint. So I'm also going to put on an allowable shear stress limit. So by means of, of those two, I'm going to move them over here because as you uh, probably remember, what we need is the location of, not the location, but the, the maximum moment to uh, look at the normal stress and the maximum shear to look at the allowable shear stress limit. So both of those, uh, some students do very well without a shear moment diagram. I tend to find them useful. So they should actually go fairly quick. problems where we have uh, a nice uniform load like this or just a, a single point load, those uh, shear diagrams at least tend to go fairly quick. then you can almost uh, draw the shoe diagram in a few seconds. And then once you see that, uh, you should be able to pick out at least the points of concern with the maximum moment. Remember what we're looking for is uh, a normal stress that can withhold that maximum moment due to a certain, what we call the section modules. Nobody's missing. You're so busy. You have to work on this bright Monday morning. Oh, well, not so bright. Uh, come in. That looks like your future. Get the uh, 
reactions and the supports. Maybe check with each other just to make sure you got those right before moving on. Then the uh, Shear diagram on the first equation. All of you have been left out. Yeah, but they were talking in code. Plot two points, of course, the start and the finish, and then the slope in between, realizing there's going to be a big jump in the reaction there. So remember, the slope's 1.3 kip. So just to put it to scale, it's going to look something like this. And then remember, these two lines are parallel. So you should be able to come up with a shear di diagram looks something like that fairly quickly. Right? Got basically that. And then you can use those two slopes to uh, figure out what's going on with the moment. You don't need to actually calculate the moment. Just look at it a little bit. Figure out what's going on. That's not it, Jay. You know it starts and ends with zero moment. Do you not? Because there's nothing at those ends to uh, withstand any moment. You know the moment will be zero that the slope of the moment will be zero along that line. Starts out pretty steeply, drops to zero, the slope. So that's going to be something like that. Then continues from zero down to some big maximum. Maximum slope. It looks like it might do something like that, and then it jumps instantly up very steeply and drops to zero again, which would be something like that. And so you've got two spots to check for the maximum because you're just not sure what your scale is here. You've got to check that spot and you've got to check that spot, which is pretty easy to do because you can just do it from either end.
you got the basic shape, you're just not sure of the scale. So maybe you afraid of one more than the other. Column those make sense now you see them? For example, to check this one, just take the left end, go back to the support. What was that? Six feet. You know what that uh, what that support is. What was it, 14? That this the reaction here. 16,000, 16,000, 16 kip? Is that right, 16,6? 6? Okay, so you know that. And then uh, you know there must be then some moment back like that, yeah, we do expect negative and some uh, some shear, I'm not sure, well, we are very sure that it would be positive.
get on your cell phones, call her up. You know, we need some 16 foot I beams. of inches cubed and you're not going to get that it just divides straight away there so make sure you have units of inches cubed for s Uh, 
start with. exceeds this S, then you want to look for a beam that has the lightest linear weight. There may be other factors, or there may be size limits or something, but uh, you know, we're not actually designing buildings, we're just working towards it. What looks good now? That's what they found out in RPI on that. 
then we stopped having Friday classes for a while for people Friday weekend, Wednesday noon. Okay, then you got to check the shear stress to make sure we're not over that allowable limit. We know where the maximum shear is, or, or what it is. We're not so much concerned with where, but we certainly are with what. But then remember what area? Okay. Remember what area we use here? Pat, remember that? Are you on that part yet? Yep. Area of the web. We can't use that one to give us. No. Why not? That includes the flanges. That includes the flanges. The flanges carry almost no shear. Remember the shear is a maximum in the center and then tapers to well tapers to nothing in the end. So conservatively we take the flanges out of that, just use the area of the web, which is right there in the table. There's the web thickness. How do they label that? TW. And then that times the total ID minus twice the flange thickness. Do we do that? And since she hasn't run for cover, she must think that beam's not going to fail. Well, you took took uh, took that and went all the way back to a new S value because it was I forget what was the twelve forty S on the twelve forty was or twelve fourteen yeah you've got a pretty good margin there that's almost thirty percent with just the fourteen. Pounds per foot? Yeah. Add it on? Because that's only 1%. I can't even draw that. 224 pounds. So I got the new M max. Good. Earl's going to hire you. What? Nothing. What did you say? <laughs> How quickly do you want to be down to the principal's office? My goodness. I, I, I don't, oh man, you better hope the microphone didn't pick that up. Man, oh man. You'll never be my face of food. Never. Even going up against Bob's hard enough, but now you just made it worse. You okay, Pat? Where are you? this jump, right? right? Yeah. But that's the maximum shear we have to worry about. So we only have to protect against the 8.8 .8. and that's kip and our shears in kip per square inch so if we have the area in square inches we're okay. Something like what, 3.5 is the expected shear stress? We get the expected shear stress. Yeah, 3.35. Did I lose a decimal place here? Yeah, 
numbers are right. What did they right, point to? Three point eight five. Yes. Three point eight. Okay, that yeah, that's what I had. I three point eight five. Okay, Pat, yep. got that yep. now? So it's okay on sheer stress or not? The maximum expected shear is this point right here. Just, just before the uh, last support and then divided by the area of the web. If you're doing a real quick calculation, you can just do TW times D. But this is a, a little more conservative because we get less area, greater expected shear stress. And we want to make sure that we're under the allowable. Which we are by quite a bit. Bob, that okay now? Are we using the D shear for example? Yes. As long as the units are okay, which it is. They're in inches, right? Everything's in inches, so we get kips per square inch, KSI, which is what our allowable stress is in, so we can compare them. All right, Colin, okay. You'd, you'd, you'd walk in this building, you'd send your loved ones out, your little brother, who you hate because he stole your truck. You don't have a little brother, you don't have a truck. No, a jet truck. Toy truck? Talk to it. Maybe that explains you, then. You don't have any toy trucks. Toy horse. Man. All right, any questions before we go on to the next phase of this beam design? Okay? All right. Here's the next thing we've done. These have all been prismatic beams. Do you remember the definition of prismatic beams? Same material. Same material throughout, though we can handle if they're not with our, uh, our uh, non similar material techniques we were using a month or two ago. What else is def part of the definition of prismatic beams? There's three parts to it. We've got one. It's all the same material throughout. So we've got the isotropic, same material throughout. Something to do with the y-axis. What was that? y-axis symmetry, symmetry about the y-axis. What else? This part may not have been as obvious because it's always been the case. So it just really may not even come up. Constant cross section all the way down the length of the beam. It's certainly to our advantage to at least consider now if that's something that's important. Uh, the most obvious example that you've seen is imagine you have a bookshelf. You've all seen those type of bookshelves where you put a track against the wall and then you clip the bracket into that track and then you put the shelf on those brackets and then you lay the books along the bookshelf. What do those brackets look like? They're not uniform cross-section beams. 
And they are beams. They're loaded beams just like any other beam we've been looking at in this class. What do they look like? Aren't they much more like that? Because with this kind of load, there's a lot of moment back here, so you need a lot of material. But as you go farther out on the shelf, away from the wall, the moment decreases, so decrease the material too. There's not as much to carry. In fact, as you get to the end of the bracket, there's no moment there. You might as well have no material, and that's where the bracket ends. So the brackets are essentially elongated triangles. They might have a little more shape to them. The type you've probably seen are the ones that have a little hook like that. That helps hold the shelf in so it doesn't slip off. And then there's a little bit of design to them like that. But these, and even those to some degree, are, are very easy to make. They're made out of a constant thickness plate. And they're just stamped out. And it's really economical to stamp two out of those out of a little section. All you have to do is have the those uh, hooks that go into the track usually look something like that and then you can get two out of a single piece and you're not wasting any material by selectively designing the cross section to best meet the load at those points so we're going to take another problem very very straightforward one we'll keep this one uh, kind of simple so we're not bogged down in the details. But start with a very simply supported beam and very simply loaded. 500 kilonewton on an 8 meter beam. About as simple as we can get. In fact, I think we started the uh, first week with just that type of thing. Now here's the deal. Imagine that we've already got beams in stock. We don't want to order new ones if we can use up these ones. Have a whole bunch of 8 meter beams sitting around. Earl uh, gave us a big special. I took a chance. I bought them all. Now we've got to see if they can do the job for us. So here's the beam. Oh, i got to make sure. I can't remember this beam's in the book. If not, I'll just give you the give you the numbers. Yeah, this beam, our, our book doesn't go quite up to what this, this beam is. So we've got a couple W690 by 125 beams in stock. Now, don't bother looking it up. I'll have to give you those numbers. The cross-sectional area is 16,000 square millimeters. The section modulus is 3510 times 10 to the third. That's millimeters cubed. And the moment of inertia is 1190 10 to the sixth. All of these in base millimeter units. But that's millimeters to the fourth. So those are all numbers we need. Alright, so let's see what the expected moment is. Oh, by the way, the allowable Normal stress is 160 megapascals. All right, let's see what the shear is real quick. Shear diagram, because from that we can almost instantly pick up the uh, moment diagram. Obviously, with a nice symmetric loading like this, single point loading, we'll have 250 kilonewtons and then 
since the load curve is zero, then the slope of the shear curve is zero. And then we jump down to minus 250. So real easy to come up with the shear diagram, which makes it then real easy to come up with the moment diagram. And I want to pay attention this time to where the maximum moment occurs. Let's see, uh, the area of that 250 times 4 meters, constant slope. So we know the moment diagram and that this maximum moment is a thousand kilonewton meters. And it happens at the center. Okay, so check that beam, make sure it's okay. We've got, uh, got about, uh, about 10,000 of them in stock. They're down by the soccer fields. Check that beam. You've got the allowable normal stress. This beam is already in stock, so the section modulus is already chosen. And you know what the maximum moment is. get for the normal stress limit for that beam. What? Uh, this isn't funny. This is serious business. 285? Really? This comes out to be 285. Ruby, you're looking dubious. I think I told you that was it. I did end back so the allowable one came up with the S value and the C was more or less than that. I got 6,250 times 10 to the third millimeter cube. So the S we need is much greater than what we have. That's what I got, yeah. So why doesn't then this come out 
to be. Listen, are you sure your units are okay? Well, the easiest one to do is change the meters to millimeters. So, oh, and then, uh, yeah, we've got megapascals, uh, one megapascal is a thousand, so they cancel. Thousands cancel, so it's just a thousand over 35, 10 times 10 to the third. And that will be, oh no, not Pascals, this is Newton's. That will give us kilo. Nope, we're still out okay. Wait, what are you? Is that a out there? Because we, this, that'll give us the, that'll give us the millimeter squared on the bottom, which we don't want. So, thousand millimeters per meter. Q. So those will cancel. So that's Kilonewton. Okay, that'll be kilonewtons per square meter, which is a kilopascal. Now we make it a megapascal. Now we're okay. Kilonewton meters is a kilopascal. Okay. So what's that come out to be? 1,000 times 1,000 squared is what, a billion? Still get the 285? Some <laughs> sucks. Are those Well, as long as it matches, as long as it's megapascal. Why? Well, I just mean for the, the, the actual problem. That's, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> what? What's a lot? What this? Yeah. No, that's the number I used all the way throughout. What else? One sixty megapascals. That's the number I used. So, but do we, you, you checked yours and your S is still coming out low, but this is coming out. Okay, so where's the problem? Screws up the whole problem. Because I've got all the units right. So, check, check S versus M max. Signal allowable, which is what you, mean, you said you did. Okay. Huh? Why is that okay? It's really fun. Oh, yeah, it's not okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> we had what we wanted. I don't know. You were acting like it was okay, and I, so I was paying attention to the details and missing the ideas here. Yes. So that's too big for this. So it's going to fail. However, whew. so uh, what it turns out is that this beam is okay for part of this load. Somewhere maybe in here, the beam's okay for the ends, but not okay for the middle. So what we can do is, here's our I-beam. Earl felt bad about this. 
So what Earl's done is made available some steel plate that we can weld on just for this center part portion. And then protect against that. So we can use the beams we've got, bolster them up a little bit where we're worried about them, and come up with a beam that has enough of a section modulus, because this will increase the section modulus by quite a bit, a lot of area away from the neutral axis. And then we can do, uh, we, can, we can increase that significantly. So here's what I'll do for you. I know a little, most of you were a little disappointed about that test score. So do this as an extra credit problem for Friday. And I'll just throw 10 points on the test. Up to 10 points. So what you need to come up with is two things. How long should these plates be? And how wide? Yep, those plates are 16 millimeter plates. 16 millimeter plate steel. And for those of you watching the video, you weren't here, deal's not open to you. Come to class. So, got the picture. What will happen is uh, once we add those plates, that will increase the protection still a little bit more than we need. But uh, I guess the ideal would be if we had plates that actually tapered at the edges, but that's too much work. We just want to throw on some, some steel plates there, weld them on, Got the picture, is that a fair deal? So we want the length as well as You need the length and this width of the plate. Because the length you can determine just from this diagram. Where is it that, that the beam no longer can support the load that's increasing as you go towards the center of the beam? The, the moment's increasing from the ends. The beam's okay for a while, but then sooner or later it's not a good enough. So you need to find that point. That'll give you L. And then you need to find uh, B such that the, uh, the section modulus increases to this new value here. Remember, this was uh, insufficient for this, so we're going to increase the section modulus until now it's enough to withstand that load. And that will determine B because that will be the part of uh, the section modulus, which is I over C. So C is increased, but I is going to increase by a lot more. Is that a deal? It's a little outside the test, but I know you wanted some, some uh, help here, and this isn't that far removed from it anyway. Pardon? 
So, yeah, Friday. Look nice. You got plenty of time to do it. Colin, 